Bloomsbury set were always very sniffy um, about Wedgwood because he did create works of phenomenal beauty. And you think of, you know, the Portland Vase, the Frog Service, uh, the Jasper Ware. Um, and yet his eye was always on the mass market. Um, and so he created systems of production and consciously did which stripped away individuality, which stripped away creativity. He, he famously said in his own factory that he wanted to make uh, machines of the men such as cannot err. So all of that individual, you know, well, all of that kind of studio pottery, again, would have driven him mad, uh, that you were creating a, a product and you are a manufacturer. Um, and for him, there was no shame in that. But also, again, as, as, as we've uh, discussed, one of the really interesting intellectual shifts in the mid 18th century behind consumerism was the virtue of luxury and, and that kind of ascetic um, Abbey idea um, mm. of the, the perils of luxury fell away thanks to the writings of Adam Smith and David Hume and mm. above all Bernard Mandeville that actually mm. buying and selling and spending and consuming and making mm. your house beautiful and making yourself beautiful and buying nice clothes was part of a prosperous and healthy civil society and actually was was liberal that helped create a liberal society so it was it was virtuous to buy chippendale furniture or wedgwood mm. tableware and that was a big mm. shift in thinking mandeville so mandeville just to remind us all he wrote i think something called the fable of the bees which was uh a, a, a fable, a, a lesson, telling everyone that they should sort of rush around and work very hard. Is that more or less what he said? Well, he said, I mean, very interesting, he said sort of private vices deliver public virtues, that we we condemn, you know, the, the dandy uh, spending lots of money um, on the sort of handkerchiefs and exactly yeah. fine suits. and But actually, it's the dandy um, through conspicuous consumption, who is creating employment, who is driving innovation, who is supporting mm. artists and designers. Mm. And there's this virtuous circle mm. through buying and spending and selling and wealth creation. So what Mandeville was doing was kind of taking on the, you know, ascetic, self-denying a Christian tradition. And that's why he was denounced. He was denounced as a kind of modern Machiavelli, um, so a kind of godless philosopher, because he was denouncing that idea of kind of simplicity and poverty next to uh, holiness. He said, no, 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 that, you know, if you do that, you have backward authoritarian societies. And what you want are virtuous, flourishing, creative societies. And luxury is an important component of that. Well, where, where do you stand on this, Tristan? Because you're a Labour MP. Um, one of the very nice things in the book is that there's a sort of uh, sort of undercurrent of criticism from E.P. Thompson, who wrote the making of the English working class, a sort of Mar Marxist or at least very sort of left historian. Um, but the way you're describing the, the sort of self-denying aesthetic approach um, does remind me a little bit of your former leader in the Labour Party. Um, wh why was it that you decided to where do you stand in this sort of maelstrom? Because on the one hand, you have the sort of idea of life as a sort of a monkish exercise. You, you don't consume um, uh, capitalism means exploitation. And on the other, as you say in the book, um, there's something very, very admirable and beautiful about the industry and the, and, and the beautiful things that uh, that he's making. Um, that, that's, a, that's a long way around to, to ask um, why you stopped being an MP uh, in so contrent, which was obviously an inspiration for the book, um, when you did and decided to uh, move on. Well, I mean, this was, um, I would answer that, I, I, but this, this was always the tension in Stoke as well, that um, uh, as J.B. Priestley, when he came to visit Stoke on Trent on his English journey in 1934, always, you know, the great tension of Stoke on Trent was that objects of such profound beauty, such as you know, Wedgwood and Spode and Minton and Dalton uh, came out of such filthy, um, wretched um, surroundings. Um, and within Stoke, you know, the, the fact that, uh, for example, you know, the monarchy is very important to the pottery industry because births and deaths, and christenings and marriages, huge volume uh, of pottery production on the back of it. So there's always this tension, in a sense, between uh, a kind of a, a very left wing, well it used to be until they elected three Tory MPs, but a left wing community in Stoke-on-Trent uh, connected to high levels of, of capitalist production 
um, <laughs> and often luxury yeah. uh, production. Mm. So I, I, um, um, I, I was elected uh, MP for Stoke on Trent Central in 2010. Um, and um, I, I, you know, huge privilege, wonderful years representing Stoke. But after the 2015 general election, um, I, I was very opposed um, to uh, the election of Jeremy Corbyn uh, on the grounds that uh, he would send Labour, Labour Party back to a 1930s style loss of Labour MPs. And in 2019, the Labour Party did even worse than it had done in the 1930s. So, um, but the good thing about Jeremy arriving was that it gave me time uh, to move from the back, from the front bench to the back bench and begin my research uh, on Josiah Winter. So the combination of Jeremy arriving as leader of the Labour Party, and then when 70% of my constituents in state voted Brexit, I knew my number was probably up. Uh, <laughs> and so the research really accelerated at that point um, and, and, and went forward. Well, it's, it's, it was a very providential um, uh, thing to happen. And um, you point out that the Gladstone, William Gladstone, in fact, ascribes Wedgwood's um, sort of brilliance and genius, actually, to Providence, because he, he had this problem with smallpox when he was young and um, was sort of permanently lame, and I think later lost a leg. Uh, and Gladstone says something like in your book, um, you know, oh, happy Providence that, that gave him smallpox and made him lame, because that in some way was at the sort of um, foundation of what he did later. Yes, I mean, Gladstone, I mean, did this huge, delivered this huge Gladstonian lecture on uh, Wedgwood when he opened in 1863 the Wedgwood Institute in Burslem in the mother town uh, of Stoke-on-Trent where Wedgwood uh, was born and the Wedgwood Institute which is still there desperately in a new role um, is, is, is absolutely fine building and Gladstone in full kind of evangelical flourish saw that the, the crippling of Wedgwood as a as a 12 and 13 year old because he had smallpox um, his leg is weakened and what that meant was that he could never be a thrower. He could never throw the clay because he didn't have the power in his leg to tread the threadle uh, for the potter's wheel. Mm. So if you're not going to be a thrower in pottery, what are you going to do? And for Wedgwood, he becomes the great designer and experimenter. His mind turned inwards, uh, as mm. Gladstone said. And, and that's the key to Wedgwood's success, this great experimental uh, frame uh, of mind. And as ever, Gladstone saw the great kind of lineage and all of that. Later, um, in 1768, um, Wedgwood has to have his leg amputated without anaesthetic underneath the knee um, on, on the 31st of May, uh, which he always wrote in his diary, it was St. Amputation Day, uh, <laughs> and they commemorated it every year. It's also my birthday, actually. <laughs> so you, you, you're, 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 yes. but you were born on the day that um, Josiah Wedgwood The amputation, his... exactly. <laughs> Now, Gladstone would have seen something <laughs> in that. That would have been a, you know. Now, the book is about Josiah Wedgwood, but it's also a sort of social history of the 18th century. And um, one of the nice things you do is uh, you talk about how the Industrial Revolution was really preceded by what you call the Industrious Revolution. That's something I picked up on as well, uh, you know, when reading people like E.P. Thompson. Before, you know, in the... 17th early earlier 18th centuries um british people were you know more idle um and that could be more independent spirited but the 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 the, the owners of the mills and the factories and so on it, it had quite a big job to convert you know what they call refractory tempers or whatever um into the mechanical mind that you that you were talking about Absolutely. No, the, the, the kind of war on the idler was accelerated from, from the kind of 1740s and 1750s.